this is Graphic Policy Radio at the intersection of nerd media and movements for social change. This is your host, Elon Eleven. This is a comics podcast, but it's also a comics podcast for Star Wars fans who agree with Luthen that oppression breeds rebellion, but also want to know what the Rebels' ladder of engagement looks like. I mean, they're not gathering petition signatures, then asking for a monthly donation. So I'm, a, I'm just not quite sure like what they're doing to move people from <laughs> being uninvolved to being more active supporters of the movement. That is a question that is not quite, but adjacently addressed in the topic of today's episode of the podcast, because we are going to be talking about Star Wars The Bad Batch. It's an animated series, and it's basically Star Wars doing a version of The Dirty Dozen. It's spinning off of earlier animated Star Wars series like The Clone Wars and Rebels. If you listened to the Andor episodes of the podcast I recorded you may recall guest Star Wars expert Claudia Amenabar making a hardcore sell to me that I needed to watch Rebels because it was about Rebels. And I am pretty much allergic to three-dimensional animation and put it off as much as I could. And then when I got COVID, I was desperate to try something that I could watch on my own that was sort of low stakes, whether it was any good or not. And I began watching Rebels. And at first, I thought... This is a series that has really well-designed action scenes, but the animation is so heinous. I can like, you know, it makes me want to like you basically, but I I kept in it at the urging of Claudia and also at the urging of some folks in other online communities I'm in. And after the first third of season one, I find myself being just suddenly deeply, completely freaking invested in this show. And I loved Rebels so much that I went from there to say, okay, well, what am I going to watch next? I was originally not going to watch Bad Batch at all. In fact, one of the reasons why I wasn't originally going to watch Bad Batch is because there has been a lot of criticism from before the show came out, from when the show came out, and continuing to this day about the show, were specifically regarding the whitewashing of clone characters. So the Bad Batch is a crew of clone troopers. You know, the whole clone trooper thing was introduced in the prequels. And the clones are all modeled off of a Maori actor, Tamora Morrison. And historically, they've always been depicted looking very much like him, as a, you know, a person who is Pacifica heritage. And on Bad Batch, they really do many quite look quite white. And that's the kind of thing that really makes me mad because it's racist. Right. So I, I really had some trepidation in checking out the show, but I ended up doing it anyway because I was hungry for more Star Wars content. I am not going to tell people who are put off by this that they need to go watch the show. You have every reason not to based on that. And I would say, you know, we're going to be covering Rebels, the Rebels show, which does not have a whitewashing problem that I can think of. We will be covering that later in the, in, probably in the summer in the lead up to the Ahsoka series. But, you know, come back, listen to that with us. But with the conclusion of season two of Bad Batch happening, I figure... For those of us who have watched the show and feel comfortable talking about it, warts and all, that I think this podcast could be a place to begin having that conversation. My guest today, who I will be introducing in a moment, we are both white and recognize that that is a specific perspective that will color our perhaps our tolerance of putting up with this kind of whitewashing bullshit in a TV show. But I want to be transparent about that. And there have been some really good criticism and commentary written about the specifically what's wrong with Bad Batch with whitewashing. I want to direct people to a website called unwhitewashthebadbatch.carrd.co. That's like card with two rs.co. Has a really good explanation of what we're talking about. There's freaking articles about it. I really do recommend folks take a look at those organizing aspects. I also flag that this is something that fans pointed out to the show before it came to print. And they were like, oh, we're addressing it. And it still looks bad, actually. So anyway, here we are with the imperfect piece of commercial art that we're ready to discuss today. I do think it's a show that does some interesting things. And so what the structure of this episode will be is we'll do a first short period sort of giving folks a sense of what the series is about. So for those of you who haven't seen it, you can make a determination if you'd like to watch it or not. Although again, please check out Unwhitewash the Bad Batch. And then after that, we're going to go full on spoilers as if you've watched both season one and two. 
And joining me today is Dr. Holly Schaefer Raymond. She is an adjunct professor of English who holds an MFA in poetry and a PhD in English at Temple University, where she also teaches. She is the author of two poetry collections, Mall is Lost and Heaven's Wish to Destroy All Minds, and has been included in the We Want It All, an anthology of radical trans poetics and the Bedfellows Little Black Book. Her writing about comics has appeared on Shelf Dust, and her writing about poetry has appeared at the Poetry Post, the Volta, and elsewhere. Welcome to the show, Holly. Hi. I am super stoked to be here. Yeah. I, you know, I definitely feel like our conversations that we've had in the Cerebrocast Discord's Star Wars channel specifically have been really enlightening and interesting to me and how I think about Star Wars. I, you know, so I wanted to bring that to our listeners because you have lots of really interesting thoughts about the Star Wars. And folks, if you want to hear more from Holly being awesome, she was just on Cerebrocast talking about Jamie Braddock, the monarch, in a really interesting episode that talks about everything from the Alan Davis and other periods of Excalibur. It's a really great episode. You should go check it out if you are, are interested in anything X-Men adjacent, which I think probably a lot of my podcast listeners are. But yes, thanks for joining me on this, Holly. I I wanted to start by asking you, though, like, what is your background in Star Wars? How did you become a big Star Wars fan? It's been a little wayward. I, I would say growing up, you know, the 90s and the early aughts, I wasn't really any more or less invested in the franchise than someone sort of in nerdy coteries would be. I played KOTOR mm-hmm. and, you know, read the Timothy Zahn mm-hmm. novels and everything. It wasn't really until after I finished my dissertation in 2021 that I really got very into having little projects that were just for me, that really didn't have any sense of professional development or, you know, shopping it around to it. So the first of these was just reading every X-Men comic, more or less. There were a few (laughs) I just had to peace out on because they were really egregious. Yeah. Anyway, last March... My dad died and I went back to my hometown uh, for the funeral and just wanted something to read that wouldn't make me feel even worse because I I, I kind of foolishly, the books I grabbed on our way out of the house was a study on suicide in the 19th century. Oh God. Some Paul Salon poems. Yeah. So I just stopped (laughs) into a Barnes and Noble somewhere and I saw the sort of chunky Star Wars paperbacks. And I remembered that my dad was really kind of specifically a Return of the Jedi fan. I don't Mm. remember him giving a particular shit about the rest of the franchise, but he really just liked Return of the Jedi to the extent that it was, I must have been in middle school or something when I even learned that there were two other movies that kind of went along with this deeply confusing spectacle. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. It must have been because it was when the uh, special editions came out to theaters. And I just thought I could I could get into this. Found that I actually really enjoyed them and found, you know, more crucially that the expanded canon had been reset not too distantly. So it was a really manageable chunk to just be like, I will read a bunch of Star Wars. And from then sort of remembering that there were shows that had sort of been critically talked up to me that I kind of was just like, well, I don't have time for this, you know, suddenly finding myself with time post this to just do whatever. And like you said, finding that there were really crunchy anchors to really dig into these stories because they are so rich in some ways, but also so kind of infuriating and frustrating (laughs) in others where You know, obviously, like any sort of nerd fandom, there are really noxious conversations to be had. But I think there's also really generative and really interesting conversations to be had. And a lot of those conversations are about how some of these stories kind of fail to maybe achieve the goals that they aspire to, which I... I mean, the, the, the whitewashing thing is kind of the elephant in the room. But I do think it's one of several ways in which The Bad Batch in particular is a series with really laudable ambitions in a lot of ways, but a habit of never, I shouldn't say never, not always quite committing to those ambitions in a way that's totally satisfying. 
Yeah. And I feel like it has, in some ways, fewer excuses when it doesn't than the earlier shows, which were clearly targeted to be for children. I mean, this is this is this is not a, a skewed quite as young as the other animated Star Wars shows were. So there are things that I was sort of hope it more will do, but it has not always been there. Right. That said, if you're someone who is not interested in watching all ages animation, like this isn't really all ages animation. This is, I don't know, more like teen and up oriented, I suppose. Yeah, I would show um, this to a, a 12 year old. Or yeah. 13. I mean, I showed this to anybody. I don't care. I mean, whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's what people don't have and love their kids with me. But like, you know, but it's just sort of like uh, in terms of the complexity of the stories and the politics, it, it, it assumes a higher comprehension level and tracking and understanding of the world is more, I think, the case. And so, you know, like, I, it's, it's a show that is very much about what are we doing with these population of people, these, these clones who have been created essentially as a slave army. They are historically been doing the war so that the citizens of the other countries, like especially Coruscant, don't have to actually do the violence and the fighting. And now that war is over. And so what is going to happen with them? And mm-hmm. it it is such an interesting question with the implications of what it means in terms of the world building. And also, I remember when the Star Wars prequels came out, I saw the first one in the theater, it was shitty. And so I wasn't particularly excited about the future. But when I heard that the second movie was, had, was about clones, I my brain just sort of defaulted into a number of assumptions about what the politics of the story would be in ways that made me really just not even want to see it. I had kind of assumed that like having clones fight robots was going to be the way that Star Wars decides to show you that war is actually okay because these aren't really people and the robots aren't really people and the people aren't really people. So it's okay for them to be killing each other. Well, I still haven't seen that movie because it still looks bad, but apparently that is not actually what's going on. It, it seems to be much more that Star Wars is aware that actually we have to think about cognition on both ends of this. And certainly it seems like a lot of the Star Wars project has been telling a story of how these people who have been created to be enslaved and do violence develop humanity and individuality despite the oppressive nature of their creation and the roles available to them. Does that sound right to you? Yeah. I think to say that that is an attack of the clones is super generous to attack of the clones. Okay. Just I speak as someone who hasn't seen that movie because it looked bad. It it is. I, I think the extent to which a lot of it is just kind of like, you know, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to pick on a movie that's like old enough to vote. I, I, I will say I think the animated stuff has done a lot of heavy lifting to make kind of the politics legible. Yes. Uh, in the setting. Mm-hmm. Because there's moments in Attack of the Clones where the narrative does seem deeply uncomfortable with what's going on on the screen. But there's other moments where it does appear to just be really enamored with the idea that a lot of a lot of Django fets and a lot of robots are fighting. Yeah. So I, I would say if you're someone like me who's it was not ready to be fully Star Wars pilled and is sort of just coming off this having watched the wonderful show that is Andor, you might want to take the advice of Claudia that she gave to me, which proved to be true, which is go watch Rebels. Rebels is fucking amazing. This has come up a bunch in conversations, but it Andor really is a hard act to follow. Yeah. And so whenever I found myself a little irritated with the second season in particular or the third season of The Mandalorian, mm. I just kind of had to sort of pinch myself and be like, well, this isn't Andor. It's not doing the same thing as Andor. It's not really playing in the same genre right. space as Andor. But it's interesting, though, because I fully expected, having not loved – I'll be covering Mandalorian soon, but having not loved Mandalorian season two – and in fact, just like I didn't want to deal with it because of the fucking turf. I was ready to not be into Mandalorian season three at all, but I've actually enjoyed it. Like, is it as good as Andor? No. But like, what the hell is? Is it enjoyable? Yes. And it's also not stupid. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, for me here, it's sort of like, if you're somebody who loves Andor and 
has an appetite for watching all ages animated shows and the idea of an all ages animated show that is very political appeals to you, then go watch Rebels. Rebels is very political. Claudia did not lie, but it is still an all ages show. So if you're someone who's put off by content that could be watched by kids, then like it won't, we won't speak to you, but there really is a ton of politics in this kids show. And then with this one, it's maybe if you're someone who doesn't like watching stuff that's more aged, aged down, clone, this show is, Bad Batch is very, is very political and it's very interested in issues around ethics, questions of biology and debt versus destiny, questions about what your obligation is to take care of others versus your obligation to care for your family, what constitutes a family. It's, and also just sort of like what makes it what decisions do you make and sign up for when it comes to joining a rebellion like what do you sacrifice so it's got real shit going on i'd also say if you think 3d animation is fucking heinous as i do this show is less heinous than most 3d animation in fact i think that the vistas like the space scenes or if you see like shot like you know distant shots of nature and things like this can be quite beautiful there is a number of vistas that you see in this where you're just like this really is nice i can't believe i'm enjoying 3d animation so much but this is really quite nice i feel like the the facial acting of the animated figures is sensitive enough that like the uncanny valley piece doesn't bother me the way it used to i mean i still wish it was beautifully two-dimensional art drawn by Gendy Tartakovsky, because that's what I want from life, aesthetically speaking. But the 3D animation is better looking here than it is in most things I've seen. And I think people who don't hate 3D animation would probably think this is gorgeous. I, I, I feel like maybe more so than Rebels, this is kind of inheriting a lot of lessons from the later seasons of The Clone Wars. Hmm. Where they kind of work around that Uncanny Valley trap with the facial acting in particular by, I, I think if you get around to watching the Clone Wars, you'll see they do something really kind of interesting where the physical figures look almost wooden. Mm -hmm. So after a certain point, it feels less like watching kind of stilted approximations of actors and more like watching this very stylized kind of puppet theater. When you said that, it kind of broke my brain, because I actually do see that aspect and how they do, do the figures. My hunch is that they maybe changed a few things up in season two. I mean, we can get to that in spoilers, but there's a few new characters where I feel like they do kind of verge into an uncanny valley, especially with the mouths. Mm. But I do think this show is very smart about when to lean into stylization. Mm-hmm. And the other thing I should say is the cast of characters are extremely compelling. I actually felt more interested in the cast of characters here right off the bat than I did the cast of characters from Rebels at first, in fact. I think they're given some more subtlety. I actually went back and I, I've only seen a tiny bit of the Clone Wars animated series, not the Gendy Tartakovsky beautiful thing, but like the, the regular 3D cartoon one. And I went to go watch the episodes where the Bad Batch had been introduced and stuff. And I think like... When they're introduced in that series, they are very broad characterizations in ways that I would not have wanted to spend time with these characters for long term. Like, Wrecker is way too dumb in the Clone Wars to be enjoyable. Mm -hmm. But how Wrecker, he's like the tank of the crew, but how Wrecker is on Bad Batch is fascinating and nuanced. So, like, it, it, it is taking you with these characters who are, I think, really interesting and compelling themselves. And that, that, that carries the show a long way as well. Yeah, and I, I think it has to be said that so many of these scenes are, since they are clones, D. Bradley Baker just talking with himself. Yeah, one voice and actor he, doing all the clones, guys, is crazy. Yeah, and he's he does a brilliant job. He's been the clone since the Clone Wars, and I, I think it's a real high watermark in recent years of voice acting. Mm -hmm. Michelle Ang is incredible as Omega. It's just a really strong cast, and there's a really strong sense of investment to this story in it. Yeah. And uh, the performances, that is. Yeah, yeah. The voice acting is great. Okay. I would just say, folks, that this takes place in the period after the end of the first three movies and before the, the, and before the Star Wars movie kind of begins. It takes in this period where we have 
the Republic becoming the Empire. And I, I that place and time is interesting to me for obvious political reasons. So I think that that setting and moment in Star Wars canon is a really rich run for examination, especially in the politics of the world we live in now. So if that appeals to you, give it a shot. And now we are about to enter the era of full-on spoilers. Let's take it away. So our core team in the series, you know, we've got the, basically the characters who were all introduced during Clone Wars, plus Omega, who is a young woman, like she's a girl, you know, who's also a, a clone, who, you know, joins them. I at first felt like Echo was really underdeveloped. And then when I watched the Clone Wars, I realized that's because most of his development had happened in Clone Wars. Yes. So I was like, oh, okay, I get yeah. it now. And but and and, and and Echo is a wonderful character. I, I I love the fact that the guy who they refer to as being more machine than man is the most human of them all in terms of the most compassion and vision for for supporting humanity and taking care of people and human rights and all that other stuff is mm-hmm. is wonderful. But yeah, what are your thoughts about the main the main cast and their characterizations and the sort of way they fit together as a team? I mean, first of all, to sort of dip back into the whitewashing issue, one of the really kind of pointed critiques that comes out is that they aren't all kind of equally whitened. Right. And like you said, when these characters are introduced in the Clone Wars, they're much more kind of stock figures. They're there to do this kind of A-team, Dirty Dozen riff, and they don't really become characters until the Bad Batch. Yeah. But even then, I think it's telling and not really a good look that Wrecker, the sort of big, strong, straightforward guy, is darker than, say, Tech, the super smart guy, or Omega, the kind of innocent child. Echo, I think, kind of gets a pass because he's sort of like preternaturally chalky from imprisonment and torture or whatever. But it is inconsistent in a way that sort of leans into some kind of really uncomfortable things. This is like a super duper spoiler, but in the like very last shot of season two, we find out that this kind of sinister imperial scientist, Dr. Emery, is a sister to Omega with the implication that she is also a female clone. And this character does have a much darker complexion and does look quite a bit like the, the actress who portrays her, who's half Mallory compared to the kind of very pale, very Caucasian looking Omega. And so we come to this uncomfortable situation in the clone wars, the clones who are all obviously kind of modeled after Tamara Morrison, have a darker complexion. When we get to the Bad Batch, all of the Bad Batch are, 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 are whiter, but there's a gradation where we see the ones who are dumber, the ones who are more violent, the ones who sort of are still aligned with the bad guy faction. Um, yeah. Less lightened. Yeah. It's just... And what makes me so mad is that they have had every opportunity to fix this because it's not like, like it's season two, people raised concerns before it came out. There's just no excuse. And and, and it's, it's really wild, truly. I will also say that like, I, for me, Omega is a character where I'm like, well, I don't necessarily think she looks white, but I assume most people would assume that she was because they see like pale blonde hair and figure that means someone's white. Whereas we know that hair dye exists in Star Wars. Like, mm-hmm. It happens all over the place in Star Wars. But yeah, like I, you know, I assume that the most people who aren't really thinking about these things would read her as white, even if her, even though the voice actress who plays her isn't, and et cetera, et cetera. And the other the other sort of in this other sort of like racial sub- subtlety here too, though, is you have the guy who plays Hunter. Hunter's his face isn't look doesn't look like him, but his styling, everybody's like, oh, he looks like Rambo. I'm like, it's not just Rambo, he looks like Billy from Predator. And Billy is played by Sonny Landham, who is Native American. Mm. So it's like a visual reference to an in- indigenous character from a different, you know, country and world and, and part of the world. But like it's I look at that and we were just like, oh yeah, that's what's going on with his style and look too. 
what's interesting to me is that this is a show that is so much about genetics in the sense that you have these clones who they they keep saying that these are clones that were mutants, but they had beneficial mutations. And I also just have been thinking like, okay, so what happened with the clones who did not have beneficial mutations, who came out quote unquote wrong, and those things that were quote unquote wrong were not necessarily helpful for fighting. Like they all got thrown in a pit, basically, I'm assuming. There, there's an there's a short arc in the Clone Wars that kind of deals with that that I, hmm. I, I think is really good. Cool. I'm glad that they look at that. Yeah. You know, but I'm also sort of wondering, like, well, what happens to clones who have like a negligible difference? Like, you know, a clone is comes out and they just have completely different coloring than everybody else. Like that do, does that a problem to the to the Kaminoans or like whatever. It's just a question of skills and other kinds of functions. Right. And I I think one of the really kind of rich tensions that comes out of the sort of really vexed setup of Attack of the Clones is that we find that as the Republic kind of shifts into the Empire, people in positions of power talk about these kind of living guys in language that seems like they are talking about machines. Mm. There's a line later in season two where someone is telling Echo to his face that they are decommissioning the clones, which is both, you know, obviously euphemistic, but also kind of really chillingly blunt. Well, the, 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 the soldiers do get decommissioned is the thing. Like, so it's, it is dehumanizing, but it's also like dehumanizing in the same way that military is itself dehumanizing. Right. Which I certainly argue that it is. Yeah. But I think that's another element to it, though, because it's not until pretty late in season two that I think they slow down and ask why, you know, do we want to be soldiers? Yeah. They spend a lot of time asking what sort of soldiers they'd like to be and what sort of is going to be motivating them. But it isn't until, I guess I would say until... Pabu, the 13th episode of the Mm -hmm. second season, that it occurs to them that they just don't have to do this if they don't want to. Yeah. It's just whether or not they should be soldiers is such a central part of the biology versus destiny questions which they are facing. When they also, the other reality is they're dads. I mean, Hunter is especially a dad. Like he is the daddest of the dads. The Mm -hmm. others maybe are more like older brothers, but it's like, are these, any of these identities compatible with each other and their obligations that they have as a result of them? Right. And I think there's friction early in season two where the extent to which Echo kind of at first blush seems to be the most dysfunctional father figure turns out, like you said, to be the most kind of ethically committed on a broader scale, right? Where the rest of them are like, what can we do to provide for this child that's fallen into our hands? Where he's less satisfied with that, less because he doesn't give a shit about Omega. I mean, I think it becomes clear that he definitely does. But because he's more open to an actual ideological commitment to resisting and fighting the Empire... I think he recognizes a little earlier than the rest of them that this is something that can be pushed back against rather than something they can just kind of stay a step ahead of. Yeah, yeah. And and I also don't think that it's a show that has a specific answer to the question of like, what is the right thing for them to be doing in general? I think it might eventually come around to landing in there. And I think it's obviously trending towards moving them towards being, you know, actual freedom fighters in this. I mean, this is a bit of a jump ahead, but I would have imagined, but they were seeing it, that the series would have acted like the whole thing with clones is that they're just going to go ahead and do what they're told. But so much of the series is about showing like, no, they actually don't. The clones have a huge drive towards individuality. They make all different kinds of choices. And so you have clones that, you know, they want to blame Crosshair's inhibitor chip for making him have to stay with the side of the empire, but actually it's not active anymore. I mean, while we see all kinds of clones who have inhibitor chips still join the rebellion, we, we meet one of, we meet a deserter in episode two, right? Mm -hmm. I definitely think about, I know in the meta sense why we don't see more clones during the next movies. It's because George Lucas hadn't envisioned them. And that's why you don't see them in star Wars and return of the Jedi and empire strikes back. 
But I'm curious about the in-world explanation for why we don't see more clones in the rebellion, because as we see it here, clones are very much a part of the rebellion. I Part of me is like, oh my God, it's the accelerated death, they're all dead. And part of me is like, oh my God, did their inhibitor chips all get blown up and they got genocided? Or like, what happened to all the clones? Where did they go? Because here it's so clear, so many of them, you know, Becoming a freedom fighter and supporting rebels, like they are, these are, these are guys who have really close relationships with many of the countries that they have been planets that they've been protecting so far. You know, they're forced to choose between loyalty to the emperor versus loyalty to the people on the planet who they've been defending and they, they choose the people they've been defending or they decide they don't want to be soldiers anymore. Like it's awful of clones making the sorts of decisions. So like what, what is, the, what happens to the clones? Why are they all gone? And then also, like, what do we think the role is really of the inhibitor chip? I think that's kind of still open-ended. I did look up some of this and found out that Rex was around at, like, Endor. So he at least, like, made it to the end of Return of the Jedi. I'm also not totally clear at what rate they age, because they're all kind of, like, grandpa sort of daddy types. In Rebels. Right. Um, which isn't super far after after the Bad Batch. I want to say like 15 years or so. I mean, maybe even less looking at the age of Caleb. Maybe more like 10 years. Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. We meet young Hera too. Yep. I think there are hints that something happens, some sort of revolt or uprising that makes a lot of clones persona non grata here, here or there. There is a really brief shot in Kenobi where he is walking in sort of a dense kind of city. I forget where it is, but he sees a clone veteran uh, sort of sitting on the street collecting change, Mm. which I think is really interesting because that speaks to the possibility of a different kind of narrative that some of the other like cookie crumbs have been leading to. I think setting the show so close to the very beginning of the sort of transition from Republic to Empire, formally. I I, I mean, I think one could argue that a lot of the back half of the Clone Wars is about showing the Republic becoming in practice an empire, kind of even before Mm -hmm. Palpatine's coup. Yeah. Is that a lot of people don't really know what the next day is going to look like. They don't know if some of the sort of suspension of the law and custom they are used to is temporary or how much is permanent. There's the great bit early in season one where they are trying to sort of just casually hop from one planet to another and are sort of blindsided by the fact that everyone now has a chain code that they need to sort of get from place to place. I think it's actually a really interesting counterpoint to Andor because by the time we get to Andor, people recognize the kind of world they are living in. And a lot of them have either made the commitment to do something about this or made the commitment to sort of keep their heads down. And, you know, of course, Marva's really astonishing speech at her funeral deals with that, deals with her regret that it took her, you know, however many years to recognize that this empire wasn't something that was going to resolve into something humane. In the Bad Batch, we see a setting where people don't really have the data at their fingertips necessarily to make a sound conclusion. I, I don't, I don't say that to you know let people off the hook or to let the Empire off the hook, obviously. But I think with a lot of the 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 non Bad Batch clones, the regs that we see, they're sort of in a state of shell shock almost where they're very, very, very slowly beginning to realize that these institutions that they had kind of an unflinching loyalty to during the the Clone Wars itself are not repaying that loyalty with any sort of dignity. There's the scene in The Clone Conspiracy where the two guys, Slip and Cade, I think his name was, they're talking in the clone bar. And we see that we see the one of them kind of having this very understandable outrage that promises that were made about employment and pensions and sort of what a future for these, you know, this kind of very large demographic and the empire would look like. 
articulating this outrage that he's not getting answers that are satisfactory. But what's interesting is that he doesn't, at this point, translate that into necessarily anger or resistance to the empire per se, so much as there's been some kind of bureaucratic misunderstanding. And if I talk to Rampart, he Mm -hmm. will get this sorted out. And I think it makes sense, especially for the clones, because all throughout the Clone War, each of them were attached to particular Jedis who are, you know, functionally half superhero, half saint. They're not beholden to kind of the really sobering kind of materialist cause and effect that we see to really great effect in Andor. They're larger than life and they act kind of at a remove from life. And these are the kind of like effortlessly altruistic, in some cases, people that the clones are more used to answering to. So that when they do get dropped into this much more inhumane, this much more kind of procrustrian bureaucratic system, they don't, the sense I get is that they don't really have the framework to distinguish kind of mismanagement from malice. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I also don't think they just don't suspect it. You know, the the world has been so specifically ordered in a very specific way, too. Right. And that's kind of the other tragic thing that, like, it's not always foregrounded just because it's kind of such a weird feature of the setting. The Bad Badge are dads, but they're also children. Mm -hmm. Biologically, they're maybe, I, I gotta imagine, less than 13. Right. And so much of their experience is training on Camino and then going straight out into the battlefield. I love this setting that we see once in a while of the clone bar on Coruscant, just because it puts me in mind of, do you know the archetype of the Castro clone in sort of yes. 60s? And- yes. Explain that for the purposes of the listeners who might not be like up on queer history. Sure. So in the 60s and 70s in San Francisco, there was a stereotype of a, of a certain kind of gay man called a Castro clone because they all lived in the Castro. And they all sort of had this very similar look, the tight white t-shirt, the mustache, the kind of high and tight haircut. So that you see cartoons in sort of queer magazines of the period of these bars where everybody is kind of leaning up against the bar, looking precisely the same with the exact same sunglasses, the exact same tight jeans, the exact same t-shirt. I'm not sure if that's what Filoni and friends were shooting for with this particular setting, but you know, when they do sort of zoom in and you see these dozens of buff guys with the exact same haircut and the exact same outfit kind of hobnobbing, that's just kind of where my mind goes. So there's that sense, but there is also the sense that these are people playing at being adults. They don't know what Mm. someone who is not in the army or is in the base or is in the academy do. They don't know what they do for pleasure. They don't know what they do when there is a conflict that they can't resolve amongst each other. They don't know who to turn to for recourse when there is injustices being waged on them, like we see in the clan conspiracy. And that's not a set of skills that is in the Empire's interest to teach them. And we see them being kind of left behind very systematically. Yeah, yeah. I'm fascinated by the decision of the Empire that rather than having a genetically engineered army that is forced to fight for them and has no other expectation of what they're going to do with their life in general, that they'd rather draft people from around the Empire who probably do not have the same level of fighting skills and who are only there out of desperation. And it's it's th- this is the series that addresses that transition. Um, mm-hmm. And I still feel like I'm not completely clear on, like, yes, you could, th- th- it pr- and this is not a complaint. Like, I think this is interesting. I feel like it's not completely clear to me yet why the Empire is all in that way. And I think for me as a viewer, I'm like, well, the good news is the clones aren't all the same. The clones do have opinions of their own, thoughts of their own. They they go to great lengths to appear physically unique from each other. I mean, Crosshair is basically as a brand across his eye. That's intense. Um, <laughs> that's not just having a different colored haircut, you know. And so they are individuals and they do have values. And so they're not just like warriors who are going to just do whatever the Empire tells them to do, but neither are the but neither, you'd think, 
would be the the random people from across the world who have become the conscripted army or the dra- or were draftees into the army of the empire. Right. I have some th- some thoughts on that. I think one thing that helps me get over that bump is that we are, you know, like so many kind of total- totalitarian administrations, we do not really get the sense that Rampart is a super competent guy. Mm-hmm. Um, we get the sense that he's kind of motivated by a visceral dislike of clones in some way, just as much as he is by kind of utilitarian concerns. Same with Tarkin. I think part of that is that they kind of signify a remainder of the Jedi army that they very much do not want people to be reminded of. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think is that the clones aren't really beholden from the outset to anyone but each other. If one of them wants to, you know, desert or not follow an order or something like that, they don't really have to worry about the consequences of that reaching back to their hometown or their family or their district, I guess, if they're from Mm. Coruscant or wherever. I have to imagine that the Empire sees a conscript army as a tool of actual like Empire building in a way that having the clones isn't. I also have to imagine that the clones are just kind of fucking expensive. And we do see that relations with Camino are sort of increasingly tight up to the point that they just destroy Genocide Camino. Camino. Yeah, yeah. And then then its relations are very tight with the like three that remain. I feel like the Empire is uncomfortable having to be obligated to do anything for the Kaminoans because they're not people. Because they're not human. I mean they're people, but they're not human. Like I feel like they're yes. uncomfortable with how different they are from them. And they don't like having somebody else having anybody, you know, owing anything to anybody else. I and I, I also get the sense that like in addition to the discomfort, and you're totally right about like you can't threaten to kill their family back home and they don't have a family back home. And you certainly do see you see clones drop their weapons and become prisoners of war rather than fight, which is like because they don't have to worry about what's gonna happen to their their kid, you know. Yeah. But I think there's also the you know, Rampart and Tarkin are just deeply uncomfortable with the clones culture with each other. Yes. I I don't think this is canon. Mm-hmm. Um but when I was rewatching some of this stuff with my wife, she raised a question that hadn't occurred to either of us before, which is what is this thing that Rex, the sort of leader of the the non Bad Batch clones, has on his helmet? And you know, I we went to Wikipedia, we we looked, and it turns out that in the sort of now vaguely out of canon version of events, the very first kind of crop of clones had other Mandalorians come in and train them. Mm-hmm. And so they were kind of in, inducted culturally into certain Mandalorian practices as well. So that this kind of animal figure that he has on his helmet is much like in the Mandalorian, this kind of beast that is his sign from that point on. Mm. So I think even though it's kind of like marginally textual at this point, I think there also is the sense that they do have this kind of cultural solidarity, even if it's not always super foregrounded in the text. We see them over and over and over again refer to each other as brothers. And I do think there's the fear on the Empire's part that when push comes to shove, they might have more solidarity to each other than to kind of the Imperial apparatus. Which sure, like, but no. Kind of goes back to why it feels so kind of shitty that now the our like main character clones don't look that much like Tamara Morrison. Yeah. And like the clones are so have such a drive to individuate themselves. They have different haircuts, they have different kinds of tattoos and styles and art. And we meet tons of clones who, you know, are not bad batch clones who they were, you know, they refer to as regs, regular clones. It's not like the viewers wouldn't be able to tell them apart. <laughs> you know, right. they the viewers really can. It's it's uh, it's very strange to me. I, I, well, let's think about Omega. First, I was like, you know, the same way we were thinking about this with Laura Kinney as Wolverine's clone. You're like, well, if she's a clone from them and she's a girl, then this is them a gender, you know, is she trans? Are they trans? Is there, you know, right. whatever, whatever. But then I was thinking like, actually, 
what if it's just that gender is so deeply unimportant to anything they're doing that it's not even seen as a variant that matters? What's different about her is that she's a child. And to them, it might not even matter that she's a little girl. It's just that she is a child and that they are adults. I I do think it's interesting that when they meet her for the first time in the pilot, they aren't like, they don't have that like elite of one's own response of like a girl. They're more struck by her sort of kidness. Yeah. We do in sort of the broader Star Wars tapestry meet a trans clone. E.K. Johnston has this novel called Queen's Hope about Queen Amidala where she does introduce just a trans clone named Sister, who she's she doesn't do a ton of stuff. She's a fairly minor character. But, you know, as a trans reader, I was very kind of moved and impressed that this that this character exists. Yeah. And that the entire premise of her wasn't that there was sort of mad science to explain why she was a woman. She's quite forthright that she just realized that she was a woman and started to present as a woman and that, you know, her brothers, the other clones were just like, we honor this. My strong preference in terms of genre trans stories is where a character's transness kind of structurally resembles real world transness where it's agential. It's not something that happens Mm -hmm. to you because of genetic meddling or a wizard spell or whatever, which is something that I'm kind of withholding judgment to see where the Omega story goes. Mm -hmm. Because obviously a a pretty huge swerve is thrown into her story at the end of season two. But I do think you are absolutely right that within the story and sort of within the family dynamic of the Bad Batch itself, her gender is never really treated as the distinguishing thing about her. Yeah. And I, and that works much better for me than the other things. But also I think it shows that this is just one more of the different variations that people can have. And it isn't any more drastic or strange than the fact that Crosshair has a very narrow face, you know? (laughs) Right. And I mean, Um, you you brought up the sort of thought experiment earlier about clones with sort of non-optimal mutations. And it's like, I kind of wonder if Echo or Tech ever feels like a little insecure that he has a receding hairline where no one else who's ostensibly right, identical right. to him like does. An, yeah, like an inconsequential physical difference. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Or I think when he first meets Wanda Sykes' his character, she calls him brown eyes in kind of a flirtatious way. And he makes note that, well, we usually do have brown eyes, suggesting that there may be some that don't. Right. Oh, I want to talk about the thing with Wanda Sykes. For the record, guys, we're just going to call her Wanda Sykes because she's Wanda Sykes. I really enjoy Wanda Sykes' character. She's great. It took me a while to be like, oh, okay, so she might not actually be in some league with Sid or whatever. Right. But um, I had some feelings about how things were, were placed between her and Tech in the end of the season. I had read the character as a lesbian. And of course, this is not to say that you swagger makes you lesbian. Believe me, I have all people understand this. But, you know, because of the compulsory heterosexuality dominance thing, and I was just sort of like, oh gosh, they're going to make her get with a guy. Also, I mean, I read I, you know, he, this is not a, a male character who shows any particular interest in her either. And so the, the the alarm bell that went off for me wasn't just sort of like a compulsory heterosexuality thing. It was also like, are you making them have to have a love thing because you think it's going to make us, the viewers, more emotionally invested in the outcome because there's this potential for a love story? And I really, really resented that. But then a lot of folks kind of talked me down from my frustration with with that. I don't know where, I, I, it was, there was a lot of us talking about it, so I'm not sure I recall exactly what your take was on the whole thing, but. I think we're largely on the same page. I was very excited that she was going to be in this season. In, you know, in a vacuum of any other information about, you know, who her character would be or what she was doing. I do think it's refreshing that she's introduced as kind of like a very archetypal Star Wars rascal, like a scoundrel type. Mm-hmm who is shown kind of prevaricating and self-mythologizing in ways that, you know, in animation can sometimes be very strongly like villain signifying. 
But then yeah. she winds up to have their interests at heart in a much more expansive way than really anyone else that's not in their circle mm -hmm. in the yeah. show. I also found it very kind of baffling that they wanted to really push her and tech as a thing because like there's just not a lot of queer people in this series. I think it's maybe I mean, just Tarkin. And well, and Tarkin is like, who cares? I mean, yeah, he's a fascist and does nothing particularly queer other than have cool pants. Yeah. You know? I mean, he like he he sleeps with a stormtrooper or something in like a story I haven't read. This oh God! What, so that's probably what, like rape, even like yeah. I just don't. This is what Wikipedia tells me. <laughs> this is I just um, don't care. So like, yeah. So like, you have her show up being obviously queer. I don't necessarily. I I, I even read her as potentially being an ex of Sid's. You know, mm -hmm. like an ex who she's friends with. But it felt like, why are you putting her with tech? This is so fucking random. It's not. I'm plenty of invested in these characters already. You know, and this isn't a show about romance per se. You don't need to make me like. I, you know, I don't have an expectation that the show is going to have queer characters or any of the things that we'd like to see in that. But I was also like, wait, why are you doing this on top of everything else? You know, I've, right. but I've seen a number of guys sort of felt like they liked the idea of having this badass woman approach a shyer guy and her liking him felt good to them. And I can see and respect that. I think their very last scene together is kind of sweet because she really doesn't push it. It really feels like she has a moment where she's like, this isn't the shape that a good friendship between me and him is going to be like. And I am going to sort of meet him where he is and meet him where he is sort of willing to meet me in terms of like social cues and things like that. I think that actually hit me as a lot more tragic than if they'd had like a big, stupid, dramatic kiss before he gets on the ship mm -hmm. and leaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To speak to the whole autistic reading of the character, which has been supported by the actor's reading of the character or not. It's not super my thing to speak to. Yeah. Yeah. S same here. I'm just sort of like, I don't need but to I, have them tell me from word of God. And it's also not something that like, I don't see how it's particularly helpful or not helpful. So. Yeah. I, I have spoken to a lot of friends who really appreciated it and really felt kind of recognized by the monologue he gives to Omega. Yeah. When that was sort really of like, good. yeah. When she is sort of like, what is your deal? Are you not sad that our brother left? And he he gives this really quite moving speech about how he's just processing things differently and he wants to be recognized for that. Again, I I feel like I don't have like a personal background to say this felt right to me, this didn't feel right to me. But uh, I've heard it from enough people that really felt like it was important to them. Yeah. To sort of give it yeah. kudos. I, I do think this was a really good season for Tech up until obviously the last episode. Because I think he is a little thin in season one. Mm. I feel like the extent to which he occasionally veers past being kind of withdrawn to being kind of peevish in a way that doesn't always have the sort of nuance as Echo's kind of frustrations early on. I think, honestly, it was smart to get him and Echo in different places for so much of season two. Oh, yeah. I think there was a, an early season one, it felt like there wasn't enough work done individuating their particular skills. And I also think just as a viewer, I have so much better understanding of Echo from watching the Clone Wars episodes with him in it. But Right. But yeah, they definitely did a better job individuating them more later. And I like, that's the other thing. Like, So we're looking at these like, dirty dozen archetype characters and you know i just think there's certain aspects of it like oh you have the smart one and oh you have the mean one, da, 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 that i feel like there's a lot of the architects could be archetypes could be so fucking boring but i thought that the characterization was interesting enough that like if i was writing it from scratch would i have had there be the nerdy one like maybe that isn't how i would do it but if you're gonna do it this is a good one to do it with it was well executed I, you know, I think like, I don't know. I'm just glad that they let Wrecker have more nuance and not be as stupid <laughs> because he would have been very intolerable if, if he was just the way he was in the Clone Wars show throughout this. It would have been too much. In this one, he gets to be really like, he really loves and cares for Omega. He bonds with her a lot. And yeah, um, I I really do love their dynamic. And it does feel like, 
she has however many dads and then Wrecker is kind of in this more sibling relationship, but in a way that doesn't really infantilize him. Yeah. Yeah. Do we want to talk more about crosshair or some? I, I, I keep being of two minds with respect to like having the sharpshooter be the one who remains with the empire because I like don't want to stereotype those things, but also it's like, yeah, the sharpshooter is the one who remains with the empire. <laughs> It being something that you have to have distance from people to be able to do, that is part of the nature of the of that particular role. And yeah, can I digress about sort of empire semi audits a little? Please. So we had a conversation a week, a couple of weeks ago, I guess, about this post on the Star Wars blog, I guess, that was in kind of questionable taste, where in one of the recent episodes of The Mandalorian, we see some former Imperials who have amnesty, and they're talking about what they miss, and they talk about this kind of like Twinkie-looking ration. And it turns out that what happened was the actor who plays Pershing, who, he seems like a really sweet guy who's really happy to be in Star Wars. He talks about how the prop that they used tasted really good, which is fine. The blog for Star Wars then is sort of like a little thing is like, well, here's the recipe for it. It'll make you miss the empire. And it's like, yeah, as yeah. you pointed out, that's a really fucked up thing. And it made me think about how a byproduct of the structure of Star Wars as a franchise, where you have something with the tone of Andor and you have something with the much kind of like, a uh, campier serial movie tone of the Mandalorian and you have kids cartoons and you have sort of young adult cartoons and you have comic books and novels, there's going to be tonal discrepancies. And sometimes where this tonal discrepancy sort of creates friction is really interesting. And sometimes it's really annoying. Like I feel like post Andor, it's really kind of like, no, you can't tell the viewer that they miss the empire and they want to eat empire cake. But also you shouldn't have said that from the very beginning. And they've done this cutification of it ever since it became a product that they were selling. I don't mean selling action figures, but I think ever since the, the ever since the 21st century, it feels like they've been happy to have people play into being the empire and having it be sort of like how I complain about the way Marvel situated hydro when it comes to merchandising. Like yes. these are two teams you could, are you team this or team that? I'm like, no, you're not supposed to be team the fascists. Yes. Um, and I'm very pro there being characters with complex nuanced motivations for why they do any of those things, but I don't want mm -hmm. to be sold a empire breakfast biscuit. Like this is something I should want you know, instead do rich, complex, interesting characterization work with Crosshair or Deidre or whomever, but like don't sell the accoutrements of the fascist state as a desirable thing that I want. That's so funny right. and tasteless. It's like an artifact. I think nowadays, largely kind of like vestigial notion that this story is primarily a B-movie homage where it can be campy that they're they're called the stormtroopers and they never hit what they're aiming at i think it's sort of a case of trying to have your like literal empire cake and eat it too mm -hmm. where it's like how seriously yeah. do we take this as a an organization that kind of destroys life and destroys happiness on this sort of galactic scale and i think your point about Crosshair's position as the sniper and kind of the guy who has to be at a remove from the things going on around him maybe sort of circles around to that because like he doesn't have that like intimate proximity to things even in terms of like how we see him socializing it's difficult to imagine him in the clone bar right uh, right the most kind of vulnerable we see him really is when he is alone or with just Cody at the memorial wall where he's sort of immersed in this sort of recollection of people that are no longer there to be complicated and nuanced and frustrating. They're reduced to this sort of binary. They're here or they're not here in the same way that, you know, the people that he is assigned to 
hunter, killer, trainer, or whatever else are. He kind of affords himself, I mean, this is kind of a stretch because he's, I don't think he's ironizing the empire in a way that a lot of the sort of merchandising arm of Disney and Lucas films is, but he's permitting himself space to interface with the empire as sort of an abstraction. Yeah. And I think that's part of what's really kind of visceral and harrowing about the outpost. Yeah. That's an amazing episode. I'm so, the entire time we're watching the outpost episode where it's just the episode guys from near the end of season two, where we finally see crosshairs realize that the empire does not give a fuck about him. And it doesn't matter mm-hmm. how loyal of a soldier he is or how effective of a soldier he is. He is nothing but meat for them. And they don't give a fuck about him. Such a fucking good episode. I also really love him bonding with Mayday. Like that's a really cool friendship there. And I'm glad that that, you know, his friend getting fucking killed is he finally gets, he finally gets, he finally sees it. But from the beginning of that episode to the end of the episode where you have that completely unqualified imperial human douchebag leading the squad, every 10 minutes, I'm just like shouting like to my spouse. I'm like, frag him, frag him like this is a Vietnam War movie. And then finally at the end, he frags him. And I'm like, hooray. So I was really glad and gratified by that happening. Incidentally, apparently they're believed to be over 700 re- incidences of fragging during the Vietnam War, which may be the record, certainly in American history. So that, that was an interesting fact to learn. But yeah, like I, the whole thing was just sit up the whole time. I'm like, please, I need you to frag him. And finally he did. And like, that works for me so well as being the act that finally makes Crosshair shift his positionality you know, like for a lot of people, they would, a lot of shows would have made it be something about his understanding about Omega as a child. That isn't mm-hmm. what it takes for him. He is a tool and it isn't until he sees one of his fellow tools being discarded. Because again, he sees himself as a soldier. Good soldiers follow orders. That's what we're supposed to do. What are your thoughts about why that was the moment that finally broke him? I think it is, to a certain extent, the intimacy of it. Mayday was someone he had sort of held in his arms and tried to sort of coax back to life and just couldn't. And to then have him kind of discarded as like an administrative rounding error almost. I think that was the disjunction that got him on a more kind of like nerdy level. I kept thinking back to that episode of Rebels where Rex is kind of going undercover and he's in Stormtrooper armor and he keeps complaining about how shitty it is. Mm. compared to the clone trooper armor yeah and i think there was an element where crosshair is just someone committed to doing a good job realized that they weren't sacrificing their lives for an important asset or for you know an important location or whatever they were dying for mass production shit Mm -hmm. and that it wasn't just a question of them being a write-off it was a question of them being a wasteful write-off Right, Because as with Rampart, I think the ineptness of the officer in this episode is just as important as the malice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the ineptness is part of what gives gives him license to finally say, fuck this guy. Yes. Because he's all about the competent. He's all about competence. I love how they display his skill, though, in this show. What it, it, it's, it, it takes, they do such a good creative job of, like, doing his sniper work and how they depict it. Like you really get a sense of how extremely good he is and strategic. Yes. Do you, do you play D and D? I do. My wife plays a ranger. Ah, Um, my husband plays a ranger. (laughs) And whenever he uses those little mirror things, she's like, if I write that up, can I have that? Hmm. Because such he, a is great an ex- tool. he is an extremely just cool take on that archetype, you know, on top of the kind of moral complexity of him. I think the other big crosshair episode in season two, the solitary clone, where he goes to this sort of separatist holdout planet, is also a really kind of complicated and messy episode for him. But he's just so, so slick to see an action in it. And I think that oh, episode yeah. sort of to go you know, all the way back to some of your reservations about the animation style or sort of the, the, the animation choices. 
I think this episode in, in particular, the action set pieces are such a sort of showcase for what mm-hmm. works well about the style of this show. And this, the, all of the Star Wars shows I've seen do an excellent job of staging their fights and action scenes. It's interesting because for me, that is not the most important thing about whether or not I enjoy a cartoon. It's mm-hmm. like actually far down the list, but the Star Wars animated shows are so good at it that it balances out for me for some of the things that's lacking that are things that I often care more about. <laughs> Cause I'm like, they really stage a good fucking fight scene. It's got really great action scene direction. And, and yeah, and those ones with him helping to storm that separatist compound is really well done. Yeah. I think one of the particular strengths of the Bad Batch more so than the other the other two kind of similar 3D shows is that like the fact that the core characters have evolved from these sort of broad niches means that the audience immediately has kind of like a broad sense of how they will behave in a fight scene. And so then the way they diverge from that or the way they complicate that becomes something that like it's cool to see, but it's also kind of illustrative or revealing of character stuff. Hmm. It's interesting also because they don't use Hunter's senses powers a ton. It just doesn't come up a ton. And so it's interesting. Like, I, It's cool that he's the leader because it isn't just because of some powers he has. It has nothing to do mm-hmm. with his powers. He's the leader because that he has leadership skills. Him having better senses than most people is like a cherry on top, you know? Right. Oh, and also this is like a, this is a Star Wars product which means to a certain extent it's also about the vietnam war like that's right. sort of baked in baked into it so yeah so one of the things that has been appealing to me about other star wars media but has never actually been present the way i'd like it to be in what i've seen are is the potential to do things like talking about the politics of the senate and those manipulations and and all of that uh, the episodes that we've had here where we get to follow a young, idealistic, and moral and brave young senator who is trying to, who recognizes how fucked it is that the clones don't have a seat on the council and that the clones are seen as completely disposable. And there's a whole intrigue thing built around that. I thought it was a really cool plot line. And I, I'm always happy to have more of it in there. But I ulti- and ultimately it's super bleak. I mean, like I the way that Rampart, who's a piece of shit, is like the, the the emperor just completely gets to use him as a fall guy is just yet one of the many examples of all of the layers of different fall guys that the emperor has set up before. Yes, and I feel like our reintroduction to Rampart in this season obviously is him making someone else a fall guy. There's mm-hmm. the clown who refuses to falsify his reports to kind of continue the the falsehood that the Bad Batch is dead. Yeah. So in the face of his conviction, Rampart just kills him. You know, you mentioned earlier the original trilogy is really deep roots in George Lucas responding to Vietnam. You know, whether or not he responds to it, especially coherently, is up for debate. <laughs> but one one kind of interesting thing about this arc that maybe might have been lost since you didn't watch the Attack of the Clones, is Senator Bertoni. Her full name was actually Hallie Bertoni because Lucas was not in a particular, particularly subtle mind space in the early 2000s either. There's a lot of that sort of Bush-era prevarication and sort of hyper-real known knowns and known unknowns to the way that information is kind of manipulated throughout Rampart's whole little B-plot in the season. Mm-hmm. And I think it's super fitting that he has this humiliating public downfall in such a way that he gets exactly what he's been asking for, but in a way that manifests as his kind of defeat and Palpatine's victory. Hmm. Yeah. I... I also really loved that two-parter. There's quite a lot of Senate stuff in The Clone Wars, the cartoon. But big stretches of that are much more kind of... I I think, crucially, that show was airing on Cartoon Network for a long time versus just being a a web show. 
So maybe had to write more towards actual children more consistently. Yes. Yeah. But a lot of the Senate stuff we see in there is kind of, I don't want to say they're bad episodes, but they're more often kind of neat morality fables Mm -hmm. or instances of Padme believing the good thing and Palpatine believing the bad thing. Whereas I think one of the really fascinating things about this arc is that it shows even the characters that we like and who we're rooting for and whose qualities we admire is deeply naive about what kind of world they're suddenly in. And I think as sort of a post Andor piece of Star Wars, it really struck me that when we see Chuchi kind of delivering her address, I forget if she's speaking in defense of clone pensions or against the conscription bill. She's essentially speaking to an empty room yeah. after the sort of very like cluttered kind of kaleidoscopic vistas of funny aliens and little cameos that we get in the prequel movies. She's addressing a political body that has really kind of given up its pretensions of being like a representative government in the same way that we see Mon Mothma and Mm -hmm. Andor occasionally in her sort of day job, addressing these kind of unlistening, very sparse, very thin kind of crowds. But I think with much less, much fewer illusions about what kind of an actual material lever she has in that room. Part of me wonders if one of the reasons there are so many child senators is because this series believes that you have to have a childlike level of idealism to believe that the Senate matters. I think it's children and Jimmy Schmitz, because Bail Organa is pretty pretty consistently a real one, except on the on the point of droid rights. Yeah. I think we get a few token good actors. We have Bill Organa, we have Mon mm-hmm. Mothma. When I was sort of taking notes on this, I found out the one human woman in the clone conspiracy who's like, you know, I think Senator Chuchi is raising a great point. She was apparently some body in Rogue One. I didn't recognize her, but, you know, hmm. that's something. I do think you have a good point, though, that at this point in the franchise, most of the kind of benign or altruistic figures in the Senate are either naive or playing different games. Uh, Because obviously by the time we meet Mon Mothma and Andor, she's going to Senate meetings, but she's aware that her real work is being done elsewhere. Yeah. Um, Ditto Bail Organa. I think by that time he's like elbows, elbow deep in Rebels stuff. So it's these two kind of worlds of believing that something better than the Empire is possible, but there's not overlap between them. Um, yeah. And I think that's kind of the core tragedy of this two-parter. It's that Senator Chuchi, I think, truly believes that the powers at her disposal could get justice for the clones. And I truly believe that she thinks just working out this pension issue working out this issue of, you know, continued employment is as far as it will go, at least initially. I mean, you know, we see her again at the end of the season briefly in a much more kind of like militant context, but that, you know, by then it's not really her story. Yeah. It's funny. Also, like I fully expected her guards to be completely useless, but one of them wasn't good on him. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, I do love that sort of espionage government conspiracy piece of it and just watching Rampart go down, but then having it fully pivot to being in the emperor's favor is just really a killer. And at first I thought the whole thing was going to be the Senate will find out and the Senate won't matter. The Senate won't care that there was a genocide having taken place, but the Senate does care and it just doesn't work. It doesn't work anyway. I had the same expectation and I was kind of pleasantly surprised. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think the staging of the little Palpatine hole opening up in the floor and him kind of just rising out of it was so mm-hmm. kind of like perfectly Star Wars. Like it's a very goofy visual on paper, but in the moment it really works because it's like here he is at the center of the Panopticon and you didn't even see him watching. He was there, yeah. Yeah. That's a great way to describe it. Our and our episode, we talk about Panopticon a lot, <laughs> not surprisingly. The other big political with a capital P storyline here is regarding 
the the planet Ryloff, which is the planet of the often green and blue tentacle-headed people. There's so many tentacle-headed people in Star Wars, and for that, I'm grateful because I love a good tentacle head. There they and um, Harris and Dula, you know, from Rebels. It's her people, and I I was so struck by how I was glad that the show recognized that there were pre-existing political factions and st- strife within Ryloth, irrespective of the existence of the Empire being there. Yes. And, ha- and how much Tar like, resents General Sindula's popularity. General Sindula, you actually get a good sense of why he's so popular, like, and it isn't just because he's a badass, which I appreciate too, but that there's this existing political rivalry it also, however, again, is another show with like, I think we, you know, Holly and I were talking, there was literally one fat character on this show who's a good person. Every other fat character is either duplicitous, evil, or beneath content, or lazy, except for one. That's really bad. And it made me think even more how during Mandalorian, the most recent episode had a number of fat characters who are not any of those things. And I was like, finally, I, the list is short. Yes. I'm thinking Orn Frita, we have the armadillo guy, we have Sid, which is, you know, its own kind of disappointing thing. I mean, yes, yeah, Sid is Sid is duplicitous. I, I, I have heard people say that they felt that Sid, you know, who's played by Rhea Perlman, Rhea Perlman does a great job voice acting. They've said that because of her specifically like New York Jewishy accent, that her being a lizard person who betrays them feels anti-Semitic to them. And like I see where that's coming from, but it just didn't it just didn't land that way to me. Perhaps it's because it was felt so oofed from any reality. Yeah. Which is interesting though, because I'm really conscious about I think a lot about I think a lot about the scrawl in Marvel along those terms. But I, I partially it might just be that I haven't put a lot of thought into the Tridotians who are the, the lizard people. Yeah. I, I think a lot of the mitigating factors, like I don't I don't love where her plot went, but it never it's one of those things where I can I can see where the people who find her anti-Semitic are coming from, but it doesn't necessarily ping that way to me. Yeah, um, and it also feels like, I mean, she's not Jewish in any meaningful way at all, right? Right, like, it feels like they hired Rhea Perlman to be Rhea Perlman. Yeah. The other thing is that, like, and this is, again, like, uh, super nerdy pedantry, but Trandoshans are such a specific thing in Star Wars, and like the stereotypes about what a Trandoshan is like are so different than the kind of like. Oh, I mean, more. I know nothing of these Trandoshans until I asked you guys to tell me about it. They're like bounty hunters. They're super physical feat and uh, physical honor and glory motivated. Like they have this tr- cultural thing where they want to do like particular feats and in particular get Wookies and get Wookie pelts to like rack up this this kind of like spiritual currency in the Great Hunt. Which is, you know, perhaps a problematic hook to hang an entire people on. But, like, it's definitely in a different conceptual space. Not some yeah. Watu shit. Watu, yeah, this, that's anti-Semitic. Yeah. yeah. Wat, Watu is rough. Oh, God. If you ever get around to the Clone Wars, they do such frantic backtracking on that species. Oh, wow. We're like what? really early, yeah. really early on, Yoda goes to their planet to get an alliance, like an alliance. And their king comes out and he's like, well, as you know, I'm a very honorable man and I would never. Oh, yeah. That was that episode. I, I saw that episode. Yeah. The Phantom Menace. I, I feel like I don't know if sensitivity readers existed in 1999. No, but, but like George. Lucas, you probably know some Jews. Maybe they could tell you what the fuck, motherfucker. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's worth addressing, but I I was so excited about the character of Sid in the beginning because you have this grouchy, non-altruistic older woman who's also compelling and kind of a badass, but also sketchy. Like, she's not a type, and she's not a type that ever gets to be played by a woman either, you know? You know what? Actually, to get get to a point of yours that you brought up off camera, I have sort of a genre fascination with what one might call the weird little guy. Yes. Which is this sort of um, semi-abjected, but also semi-ludic like ludic figure who can get away with things that being 
physically kind of beautiful and perfect would disallow. It's this figure that often has kind of like a jester's fiat of a sort. Yoda is like a super archetypal one. Um, Yoda is the arch- Yoda is the archetypal weird little guy. Yeah, yeah. I feel like Sid is almost kind of like. I've complained a lot about how you so rarely get like a woman weird little guy. You don't get a weird little gal. That's true because the the job of women characters predominantly is to be hot. Yeah, in a they're there to sense. be aestheticized, and so to have that sort of like texturality and that sort of wrinkliness and sort of like kind of formally marginal physicality is so rarely afforded to women characters. Like even Yaddle is kind of like yassified Yoda. But I I think, I think Sid does get to be in that space because like, she's not malicious, but she's not going to, she's not going to cohere to what the narrative says is dignified or good. She's going to do what works for her. She has this kind of like brassiness and this kind of earthiness. that's really refreshing. And she gets to do it while being like this awesome looking bald dinosaur. Yeah, I changed my mind. I fucking love Sid now. Yeah. How did you feel about her portraying them in this? I feel like it was the easy move. When my wife and I were watching the episode and she's sliding Wrecker that drink, we both kind of were like, yeah, Stormtroopers are coming in in like 30 seconds. Yeah. Um, It also felt a little anticlimactic just because we'd been getting so many little hints and nods about their relationship with her getting more complicated throughout the season that it just felt a little clean. I'm hoping that she has stuff to do in season three that can complicate it a little more. I suspect we'll be seeing her again and I suspect she might actually help them. It feels kind of yes. a given almost. Yeah, I hope so. She does have a great design. I think she's a great foil to Wanda Sykes. And I think in a s- season two, especially is so much about people trying to get to a point where they can commit to saying what their priorities are and what their principles are, that it's useful to have a character who knows precisely what her principles are and is willing to have them run counter to what the narrative wants and what the viewer wants and what the Bad Batch wants. She's been extorting them from moment one too, right? Like they are indebted to her because she will tell on them. And then they go run off and don't work for her so she does what she she does what she told them she would do yeah she's not deceiving them she's not being dishonest with them she tells them exactly who she is right away so you know what good for her she should yeah. you know not work not work for the empire but broadly good for her yeah, I guess I just ultimately need to put a capstone on Wireloth. I thought it was good for us to get an up-close look of what happens on a planet when it pivots from being a republic to an empire. I would be perfectly happy to watch a series that was just different planets responding to that moment, because that's such an interesting moment to me. What um, I would love is a scene somewhere, you know, it could be in a show, it could be in a movie, it could be in a book. I really want to see Cham and Sagarera interact. Yeah, because those are two characters who know almost precisely what's up with the Empire very early on, and who are very strident and very direct about what their response to it's going to be. And who, you know, we see in enough places, at enough points in sort of the progression of the Republic into the Empire, into the New Republic, that we get a good sense of like where their convictions lie and where they're willing to budge and compromise and where they're not. Especially because I think in season two, more so than season one, I feel like the Bad Batch kind of drops the ball with Saw to a certain extent. I mean, what hasn't? <laughs> I guess Andor hasn't, but... Andor hasn't. I'm, ac- I'm honestly perfectly fine with who he, the role he's performing in, in, in season one of The Bad Batch. He's the guy who knows what the situation is before they do. I will add, though, that in the beginning, like in Rebels, Syndulla does not feel like they have an obligation to help other planets. He is very much thinks that he can just fight them off on his planet and that that will be enough. And it's Hera who convinces him that actually this is all part of a global picture and it's not enough to just defend your own planet. I think that's an instance where I kind of have like a cognitive, like I just struggle with the scale of Star Wars because like, to me, a planet's pretty big. 
Like if he if he's thinking collectively for all of Ryloth, I think that's pretty good. Um, good point. But then again, like you know, to be fair, it's not like we know how big planets are in Star Wars. I guess. Let's talk about Saw Gerrera more. He's certainly a character that anyone engaging with Star Wars from a left perspective is going to be interested in digging into. You know, he's the character played by Forrest Whitaker in Rogue One, the best of the Star War. And in some shows, he gets treated a little bit like he's a real irrational, angry black man. And in others, he gets yes. to be the smartest person who understands what the fuck is actually going on. Yes. And I I was so impressed with his stuff in Andor, where he's allowed to be in opposition to Luthen, but not in a way that makes him look like, like he's foundationally incorrect. And I, I think, again that in season one of The Bad Batch, by positioning him, him as someone who knows more about the situation, who has sort of a clearer view of things than The Bad Batch, that's a really good way to use him, and that's a really good way to subvert their kind of, like, very facile, go here, kill this guy mission that they're on at that point. So I was really kind of disappointed with where he lands at the end of season two. Yeah, yeah. Where he's the guy who's saying... I don't care about your mission of rescuing your particular friend. We have a bigger picture here. And they're also like, yeah, but your bigger picture isn't even bigger picture enough. The bigger, bigger picture is we need to be able to track this out of here. Right. He's the guy that wants to blow stuff up because he loves violence. And that's, to me, that's a really lazy way to talk about that sort of figure. And it feels like kind of a narrative dodge where we as viewers have spent at this point 32 ish. 32 episodes with Omega and Tech and the gang. And we are emotionally invested in them getting back together. And we know that Tarkin doesn't die at this point in history. So Saw is really kind of set up to fail uh, narratively. Because we know that he's not going to succeed. And we also are emotionally maneuvered into this position where between the two options, we would kind of we're kind of being coached to be rooting for the Bad Batch instead. When really, like, mm -hmm. there's not anything wrong with his plan. Like, right. were he to succeed at blowing up Grand Moff Tarkin and, um, you know, Ben Mendelsohn and whoever <laughs> else, that would be great for the universe. They could skip, like, three movies and just kind of, like, go home. But because we have this sort of like immiseration in canon and continuity, and we know that he's kind of predestined to not do what he's setting out to do, it makes him look stupid in a way that I think is kind of like mm. ungenerous framing. I mean, it helps that he's young in a way. I don't know. I guess I don't feel his failure is a bad reflection on him. I just feel like it set him up to be childish. Yes. By not. It makes him look to them. impulsive. I, I think impulsive yeah. is the word I'd land on. Yeah, yeah. When, like, realistically, for him to have gotten that far, to be, like, planting bombs and on his way out, like, he must have been planning for, like, months. Like, that's not... Mm -hmm. he, he didn't just walk in there. But, you know, the framing is going to favor the main characters and not Saw, and, you know, maybe someday we'll get the Saw show. And... You know, I don't know who I would trust to. to I know, that show, I'm like, but. wow, Saw's even paler than he already was when they did this in this one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, but yeah, I. He's really, he's really a character that we care a lot about, and I like that in the first appearance in this series, he's the one who gets to spare the Bad Batch. Like he's in a position where he could just as easily kill them to protect his safety and it wouldn't have made him a terrible person to have done so even. But he, he he chooses grace in that first episode with him in the series, which I believe is his first appearance in, chronologically, his first appearance in Star Wars, right? He was in the Clone Wars a little bit. Oh, okay. Well, but he's like, okay, never mind. But yeah. He's like, he's like functionally a different character. Okay. So, you know, like that he, in his first appearance here, gets to show grace in a, in a risky situation, you know, is pretty powerful from the start. Yeah, and I think crucially, he's allowed his convictions, but in a way that doesn't make him look like kind of this this 
frothing at the mouth caricature that I think bad portrayals of him do. Like he's still committed mm-hmm. to protecting the civilians in his ranks. He's not he's not playing games with people's lives. Which, you know, at that point in the show, he's like the first person we've seen that isn't to an do an extent. Yeah. Yeah. For real. I want to talk about some of the planets we hop around to, including the Mad Max planet. I appreciated how clear this was the Mad Max planet. And I just kept thinking this whole episode, when you constantly have this big boss guy, the king of barter town, as it were, telling Mm -hmm. his poor workers, if they just do a little bit better, they'll get to eat more food next time. Even though the game is so clearly rigged, even though they're so depraved. And this whole thing, I'm like, oh, this is the American economic system as portrayed by planet because every, they keep saying to this poor kid, Mm -hmm. Well, if you just try harder, then maybe next time I'll give you the award for biggest earner and you'll get more food. And with this poor kid believing that somehow he's going to luck out, this will be the one time he's going to luck out. Yeah. I'm really glad we broke him out of it, his capitalistic slumber of the American public. What struck me is that they decide to just stay and continue to be child miners. Yeah, yeah. On that planet. And it's like, well, now the child mine is going to be collectively run child mine. Right. Which I mean, I guess is better than nothing. Like I've been in grad student unions. It's kind of child union run child mining. Hey, now Uh, I'm going to jump to a listener, a listener question that mentions labor from Jack asking, do you think Bad Batch is in conversation with a very specific flavor of anti-fascistic pro-labor ideology that and or espouses? Or is it just that Star Wars is by its nature anti-imperial? What are your thoughts? I think, yeah, I think formally it is anti-imperial. Sometimes more scathingly than others. I've been appreciating the material in the Mandalorian season three that kind of sheds a light on the extent to which the new Republic is, you know, new boss, mm-hmm. same as the old boss in some ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I appreciate the elements of the clone wars that kind of take the old Republic and even the Jedi order to task for setting the groundwork for some of these things that kind of have a very smooth continuity into the way that the empire operates. But I think the labor stuff is really, I think part of the reason Andor was so thrilling is because a lot of that was kind of new to Andor. Again, we do see this kind of, you know, Oliver Twist planet where the armadillo boss gets thrown into lava or sulfur or whatever. But that's really kind of operating on like the level of fable. Yeah. Effective fable, an effective fable that people seem to believe, but yes. Yeah, like, you, you know, you fist bump. When the manager gets tossed into the the fucking dip. But like, Andor is so messy and so granular about all of this stuff. In a way that is really thrilling. Because I think since A New Hope, a lot of what made Star Wars stand out visually is that it looks like a universe that has like a proletariat in it. Places look like people live in them and that maybe they haven't been able to afford to get the Millennium Falcon to tune up recently and that people have to make decisions about what to do with their paycheck and that it's not kind of this like post scarcity utopia that, you know, you so often see in like the Federation of planets and star Trek, you know, no knock on star Trek, which I also am really fond of, but a lot of it I think is just surface. I think a lot of it is just aesthetics and so much of the charisma of Andor was in actually telling stories within that aesthetic that use that aesthetic and don't use it as sort of window dressing for kind of a Joseph Campbell thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I also think that this series in particular is really interested in the politics, but specifically in the way I was describing, like the transition between these different systems of government and different countries leadership falling versus being a more labor focused story. You know, we've talked about this, Holly and I've talked about this ourselves plenty. It's just like, God is, star- you know, the, the droid problem is star Wars yes. ever going to do the droid problem and how amazing, it, how amazing it could be if they did, you know, because that's really the labor. Right. But 
question at the center of so many of, of these stories. And periodically, they they sniff close to it, and then they chicken out. What you would expect to see after the Clone Wars is solidarity between droids and clones, because they yeah. are both being phased out in the same way. And, you know, we even see that the rhetoric that's used to dehumanize clones is the same rhetoric that re- kind of positions them linguistically closer to droids. They're talked mm-hmm, about as machines mm-hmm. that are breaking down or, you know, units that are kind of fungible. And, you know, come to think of it, I want to walk back my answer a little bit because I think the Bad Batch is about labor, but it's a ver- about a very specific form of labor. It's about the right. work it's of about, being a soldier. It's military. Yeah. Yeah. And I I, I think actually so much of what's powerful about that Senate, that Senate intrigue two-parter is that it's about such practical things. These are organic beings that they're going to need to have a roof over their head and food in their stomachs. If they're not being used for the job they were literally like bioengineered to do, how are they going to do that? Are they going to have, you know, continued employment? And if they aren't, are they going to get a pension? The series doesn't really give us an answer on that yet because obviously it's, you know, the second of hopefully more volumes. But I think it does foreground that these are important questions and questions that would be super important if you were actually a clown in a way that I don't think the franchise has shied away from in the past so much as like just the conditions of the clown war stories made it unnecessary because they all were provided for. The Republic had them all in barracks and cafeterias. We find them here sort of cast out and sort of having to figure out what their labor means and what their labor is worth in a way that they're totally ill-prepared to do. So yeah, I think the anti-fascist stuff is very much in conversation with the anti-fascist stuff in Andor. The labor stuff, I think, is running in parallel. I I think just because of, you know, the nature of it being a a 20 to 25 minute action cartoon, it's addressing them at a different scale than Andor and in maybe a much more specifically narrowed way. But I think it is definitely talking about labor issues. Yeah, I mean, I am so invested in these questions about the clones as a oppressed labor force. Like that is my my new Star Wars meta obsession. And I really had not thought much about them prior to this because I had assumed that that the adjacent materials hadn't thought much about them either, frankly. And I I like that it's so against that dehumanization. I wonder you know, when Andor was coming out, a lot of the conversation around the prison was like, well, why didn't they use droids for this? And I think the answer was because it's psychological warfare to do this to people. And I wonder if that's where a lot of the clones wound up. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, God. Probably. And fuck. Yeah. So this in this show, we've been to John Carpenter's The Thing Planet. Mm-hmm. We've been to Mad Max Planet, and we've been to Star Trek Planet. I also love how everybody was like, oh my god, they're on a Star Trek planet. For those who don't know exactly what we mean, it's that planet where people are building a pluralistic society, and things are nice, and it looks like a Star Trek episode, which is called, what's the name of, the, of that place? Pabu. Pabu. I also kind of reminded me a little bit of, I'd recently seen Poyo by Miyazaki mm-hmm. and something about the really steep cliff and the ocean kind of reminded me and, and the whole like threat of the, with the storm coming reminded me a bit of I, Ponyo. Yeah. I think that, I think just the tempo of that first episode with it too, it has such a leisurely pace to it, even when they're sort of like evading natural disaster. Mm-hmm. I think there are really kind of strong Miyazaki vibes to it. As well as, yeah, absolutely, Star Trek Planet. I think it's interesting because we've seen another really classic Star Trek planet in The Mandalorian. Just recently, the the, the Lizzo planet. Um, yes, the Lizzo planet is such a Star Trek planet. Isn't it interesting this is all happening at the same time? I loved this episode. I loved this planet. I think so much of the kind of ethical wager of the season between Echo wanting to fight for something beyond their family unit and Hunter wanting to sort of see his primary obligation to this child and his care resolving in this opportunity for them to truly just kind of experience what it would be like if they were a family not in wartime. I mean, obviously in wartime, but with the luxury of not having to be at war. 
was really interesting and seeing them in a place with such a different tempo than almost every other episode really fascinated me. In my notes I have, is this a gay island? Who knows? And I think it's just because we're so accustomed to seeing these characters like either in danger or preparing to go into danger that when they're when they're not, it just kind of is such a different tempo that it makes everybody kind of feel like they're vibing a little. Like Shep, the sort of village mayor or leader. Or yeah, he's leaders. basically presented as the mayor. Shep and also the only fat person who's like a good dude in in Star Wars. Yeah, and you know, he's not a comedy fat person either. He's like no. competent, he's kind, he's generous. I thought he was kind of vibing with Wrecker a little. Hmm. I thought Omega was kind of flirting with the other little kid in kind of like a little middle schoolery way. And I don't know if that was just kind of really wanting to see a queer person other than Grand Moff Tarkin in this show, or... <laughs> I just, like, I won't even acknowledge... Well, Grand Moff Tarkin can't be queer. He can only be gay, but we are going to... I just can't even acknowledge him. Like, I just... There's a Twitter account called Queers Watch, which just goes through every new piece of Star Wars media and says, are there queer people in this? And if so, who are they? You know, sometimes it's a slam dunk. Dr. Afra usually has, like, 16 of them per issue. Mm-hmm. And they seem so begrudging when they have to be like, well... Tarkin's in this, but yeah, I yeah. Think- like for people who like Star Wars and also like awesome things and also like queer characters, the Doctor Afra series. I've been reading the Kieran Gillen and Salvador La Roca, and then the artist who came on after him, and I'm forgetting the name. I fucking love it. It's so good. Oh, it's perfect. I, I honestly think I would have gotten bored with Star Wars quite quickly if I hadn't, you know, glommed onto that largely on the name of Gillen. But it does such kind of delightful, inventive things with the setting. There's something really refreshing about this planet and the way it kind of sets a tonal environment that's so different than what we normally see in Star Wars. Because, like, I think it feels so much like a Star Trek planet and the story takes its time like a Star Trek bottle episode. Yeah. I've I've always kind of felt that the worst Star Trek stories are the ones that try to feel like Star Wars. But I think the flip side here kind of feels cool. Like, it's good to see them, like, not being in mortal terror. And especially after the, 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 the disaster they help with, seeing them use their particular talents in ways that are about reconstructing things and building things rather than, you know, blowing stuff up. Mm -hmm. It's something that I feel like they've earned in the narrative. And seeing them make the decision to step away from it feels like it has real gravity to it, just because, like, the vision of what their life is on Pabu feels so persuasive to me. You know, I just love that they're being presented with a different kind of opportunity. I love the aesthetic of the plays. I was so worried that everybody was going to die when the tidal wave came because, like, we, we, we can't have good things. And right. I'm glad they didn't go in that direction because I think it would have been really simplistic to have them leave because it was destroyed. It's much better to have it be the way they do have it. And I think it's interesting to get to see people in a context of getting to, like, be in a community. I, I don't know. Do you have a sense of how long they'd been there? Maybe a month? Or what do you think? I think they say it would take a couple cycles to fix everything, but I don't know what a cycle is obviously long enough to acclimate and you know achieve like a role in the community like they're they're treated like people who live there so i'm glad they got that bit of a break to like experience what life is for other people who aren't just conscripted soldiers yeah and i mean I, i i think the stuff with these sort of competing visions initially between Echo and Hunter in sort of giving them the breathing room to realize what Hunter wants for them. And I I guess really what he wants for Omega, they wind up sort of experiencing this sense of empathy and community outside of the sort of clone trooper circuit that sort of nudges them towards what Echo's arguing, I think, where the empire is worth fighting, not because they are personally being hunted by it, but because it renders precarious lives that don't deserve to be rendered precarious. 
Yeah. I, I just, it's such an important piece of development for their like brains even to see that. Yeah. Because like, Which yeah, yeah. You can turn the uh, adrenaline down. Like what is life like when you don't have to have your adrenal functions freaked out at all times? Yeah. I think that's a great point because again, they are, they are biologically children. They and came out, they came out of the cloning tubes or tanks or whatever, and were trained to be soldiers and then were sent on mission after mission after mission until they either, you know, die or run out of missions. And well, I also so, like, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I also like how Shep immediately identifies Hunter as the main dad. Yeah. And it just goes, he's like, well, obviously you're the main dad. I'm a dad. We're going to like have dad bonding. Yeah. It's, it's delightful. And I love that they don't give this guy any ulterior motive. He's just a truly like open hearted and generous dude. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it's such great payoff for Wanda Sykes's character too, that this isn't a double cross. This isn't a con of any kind. She's, she's giving them the gift of this place. Yeah. I, 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 I loved this episode. So we've got a couple of other listener questions and I think we're going to wrap. These are also from Jack. Jack is on a roll. Jack. It, he really is. Child characters can often be difficult to pull off. Do you feel that Omega brings enough to the table? Does she effectively work as a character? I certainly think if we didn't like her, the show would be intolerable. So obviously she works on a certain level or else it would be intolerable. Yeah, it's kind of the Ezra Bridger thing, where if she's mm. annoying, then the show's not succeeding. Well, Ezra was annoying is the thing. And I just put up with it for a while and then he was no longer annoying. I think he gets fun pretty quick. I think once the scripts sort of have him ease off of Sabine, he improves a lot. Hmm. No, I think, I think Omega really works in almost every way. I think Michelle Ong gives a really good performance. I think she's, I think the scripts and the performance give her space to be innocent and naive about things while still, you know, being very competent. There's the moment in the, the Zillow Beast episode where Tech casually mentions that the crew of this crash ship got eaten by the monster. And she's like horrified by this, you know, she's been on however many missions and shot a bajillion people with a bow and arrow, but like, she's a little kid. She hasn't had Mm -hmm. to think about human beings getting eaten and being confronted with that is horrifying. And she plays that really, really well. I think she also is really important because she signifies something that, none of the other clones got to have, which is a childhood, which Mm -hmm. was not this like drastically abbreviated speed run to war. Yeah. But, you know, big props to the actress because she absolutely convincingly sounds like a child, but is not a child. I think about the significance of the character's name as Omega. And I prefer to think of her as Omega, which is like, I realize now is just how she says it because of her accent, Mm-hmm. But her being called Omega, like the end, the final, it feels like not a name she would want to use for herself. And so I wonder if she will rename herself in some way. That's a good question. Because like most of the clone troopers, I think, named each other. Yeah, they named each other. Yeah. But I'm, she was probably named by like the Kaminoans. Right. Did they, did they say that outright or is? No, they don't say that outright, but it just seems like it. I'm just, for my curiosity, seeing if there's anybody called Alpha. Mm. There was, but he is not canon anymore. He appears to have a machine gun for an arm. So that's cool for him. Oh, this is kind of funny. According to the Star Wars The Clone Wars DVD commentary, the creators at first had decided to put in Alpha 17 as the Clone Wars series' prime clone character. However, Lucas objected because his inclusion would make too much of an alliteration. Anakin, R2, Ahsoka, and now Alpha, so a different clone character, Clone Trooper Captain Rex, was created. So, I guess there's not an Alpha. But the name is definitely has to have with that in mind, or else why? Yeah, I'm really curious what the kind of... Because, like, we we see a really kind of mysterious plot heavy portentous continuity between the Kaminoan project and the project of the new sort of creepy imperial scientist Dr. Hemlock and they both really need uh, Omega for something 
And we don't know what it is, but it has to do with her being the last. Do you think she's just Omega because she's the last pure Django clone? I think that, yes, she's the last pure Django clone. It's so fascinating that the pure Django clone is a girl. I just, mm, I love it. Yeah, I'm so curious what her sisters are going to be doing. Yeah, I know. And just like the idea that the the last pure Django clone is trying to be conscripted into being a medical assistant. Like we don't actually get the sense that she wants to be a healer, but she certainly right. has that capacity. Is somewhat odds with what they would tell us that the clones of this great fighter would be supposed to be doing. Yeah. That's a really good point. I hadn't thought about that. So the fact that this is what they want to make her do, and she's the most Django fat of them all. I mean, yeah, she, but the thing is, she doesn't want to do that. She doesn't want to be a nurse. She wants to fight, but even in a very childlike way, I don't necessarily feel like she's a character who, when she becomes an adult, will still be like, I want to fight. I think she's mirroring and emulating her big brothers. And we see, because I, you know, I rewatched the beginning, like how much we see from her in the very beginning is just her copying Hunter, right? Yes. So like, I think we don't really know what, what or who does Omega want to be eventually when she grows up. And that's okay, because she's a kid. So I hope right. she gets to grow up and I hope she gets to make her own choices. And, and I feel like that's another area where she's really, it's it's useful narratively for her to be a child. And she also is just a well-written child character because like, mm-hmm. I, I think we do see her priorities evolve, but never in like an unrealistically precocious way. Where at the beginning, I, I think it might be less that she wants to fight and more that she wants to just leave the fucking house. I see the and dirt, these, her enthusiasm, yeah, seeing the, the dirt even. Yeah, that's a great scene. These are the dudes that are leaving the house and she wants to go with them. And then as the series progressed, you know, I certainly don't think she has as, you know, nuanced a political philosophy as, you know, Andor or Luthan Rail or, you know, Bix or whoever. But she knows that she hates seeing people exploited and hurt. Mm -hmm. And she knows that she doesn't want to hide from that. And she knows that she doesn't want to be passive in the face of it. Which is totally believable for a child, but also in the context of this setting and sort of the political reality of where the setting is at this point in its internal history is huge. And is something that I think spurs growth in her ostensible parent figures in an interesting way, because we get to a point where they're in a sense emulating her sort of purity of conviction. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And the other question he left with us was, which characters from adjacent shows would you most be excited to see cameo in Bad Batch? I think, I, well, I think Boba Fett would be interesting for... Mm, for the purposes of this, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to say for the benefit of Jack Vergare, who is okay. a... She's an evil bird made out of mushrooms who has not been canon for about 20 years. Well, that sounds delicious. Oh, I'm she sorry, is. she's not food. <laughs> no, she's delicious conceptually. Okay. I think it would be cool if they ran into young Kanan again. Mm. Hopefully young Kanan will not look exactly like a white kid. Right. It's so funny that, God, the human actor who they cast to play Ezra Bridger in the new TV show looks exactly like the cartoon character from the Rebels show. And I can't help but think that because the show was like just because the new show was going to cast a non-white actor in mm-hmm. this role, they had to really hit you over the head with a sledgehammer that this is what this guy looks like. Um, so that if anybody says he doesn't look really look like Ezra Bridger, you could be like, no, this looks exactly like Ezra Bridger. Yes. And if you don't think so, it's a hundred percent because you are a racist. Like they went out there and they found a non-white actor who looks exactly like the fucking cartoon of Ezra Bridger. It is uncanny. Um, it is so bizarre. I mean, and he's a professional actor. He's been in other things. It's not, he didn't just get hired because that's how he looks, but he's is a clone. Um, so it makes me think that they have that sort of amount of meta awareness of people like being angry at characters of color, you know? And so it's just wild. Like they, they know enough to do that. And then they don't know enough to fucking not whitewash Kanan Jarrus to the point of being completely unrecognizable. I mean, like regard, I don't know that I'd actually thought about is Kanan Jarrus white or not in my earlier watching of rebels, probably because the actor who plays him is white. And I know white people who are that tan. 
But as soon as I saw this completely like white as me and I have no melanin in my body kid in the first episode of Bad Bash, and I could not fucking tell you who it was because he looked nothing like the character. It's so right. bizarre. He looks like, like Lily. What, what's his name? Lily Allen's brother. Alfie Allen. Yes, I mean, I think he looks, he looks like Caden Christensen. Like, are you like, oh. is this supposed to be a little kid Anakin or like, he doesn't even have the same, like, never mind the whole skin tone question that people seem to be so confused by. Caden Jarrus has green eyes. This cartoon kid has blue eyes. Yeah. People's eyes change color when they're very young. They do not change color between when they're 11 and when they're an adult. That's just now how bodies work. Your your eyes are their adult color after you are no longer an infant. So what the fuck? Anyway. So yeah, Kane and Jairus, but maybe he'll actually not have be completely fucking white as a sheet. And therefore unrecognizable. It's not even good in the surface of the story if I yeah. can't tell who he is. I only knew who he was because Deepa Balaba looks, she looks like Deepa Balaba, his master. Her name is so much fun to say. Oh, it's awesome. I think when Lucas hits, he hits. And he had some truly banger names in that trilogy. Who else? Anybody else you want to make sure we see in the Bad Batch? I think it'd be fascinating to see them interact with Ahsoka. Oh, yeah. I don't necessarily know that they will because of her own show going on. It feels like it would be a lot to coordinate, like, how to make it work. But I wonder if that would be really interesting. Is she fulcrum at that point? Or do you think she's just kind of, like, kicking it? I don't know. It's hard for me to place her in terms of chronology based on what I've seen, for example. I haven't even seen the rest of the Clone Wars cartoon. As for who else I might like to see in this... You know, I'm really glad we got that glimpse of young Hera Syndulla. I love that she has still has her primary Lothian accent in there. Mm-hmm. And her characterization is so great and lovely. I'd be very happy to see her again or not. That's fine. I don't really have a wish list on this. I have like themes I want to see. Like I want to see more stuff from the Senate, you know, and I want to see how all these different countries react. I mean, oh my God, we have a Wookiee child Jedi. We I do. really want to pet him on his soft and foofy head. Um, I lo- Yeah. He is also from the Clone Wars, and my wife is, she loves him. The moment we finished watching the Clone Wars for the first time, she put a Google alert on her phone for Gunji, just in case he ever came back to life in a future show or comic or anything. And so the moment in the trailer for season two of The Bad Batch, when he sort of pops up with his lightsaber, probably the happiest day of her life. I think maybe like three times as happy as our wedding day. Yeah, I love anything where we recognize the full humanity and interest of these non-human characters. So I want to see all of my weird-ass aliens getting to be Jedis and getting to be developed. And with this being an animated show, there shouldn't be a budget issue that would limit them to mostly featuring only human kinds of actors and characters. Though, actually, can you imagine Dr. Afra on this? Yes, that would actually... She'd be like, she'd be pretty young, but like, I think it would be cool to see her as kind of a rookie. Hmm. Yeah, totally. I just, I think Dr. Afra would totally be somebody who Omega would be like, I want to be like her. And then would be like, I mean, maybe I don't. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm picturing kind of says. like the Rebels episodes where they bring Lando on board and he's like trying to schmooze. Uh, yeah, the, the Lando episodes of Rebels is actually what sold me on Rebels. I was like, actually, this is wonderful. I mean, one of the questions that I really don't know why Star Wars, maybe it has and I haven't seen it, but I don't think Star Wars has answered that Like, I would love to know is how does Lando go from Lando to Lando? <laughs> you know, and I could see this taking place in a time period in which that might have been. No, Lando was a kid in this. Chronology is hard. I'll just say that I think this being animated means the show could do a lot of things with non-human characters that I think might be important and interesting. And I'm always interested in seeing my oldest friend. You may, you may have heard of my oldest friend. His name is Babu Frick. Yes. And uh, Babu Frick's may live a hundred years or 500 years. We don't really know how long Babu Frick's live. So we could see my oldest friend in this show and I would be very happy about that. I really love him. There's no reason not to put him in a show. Like, he's small. Hey, hey. He doesn't need his own trailer on set. 
Like just put in a bunch of them. Yeah. As many Babu's Frick as necessary, but even our specific Babu Frick. Is there anything we want to hit up that we have not hit yet? I don't think so. Awesome. Well, Holly, I love talking about Star Wars with you and, you know, how much I've enjoyed talking with Star Wars with you was definitely one of the reasons that I checked out this show. So oh, thank you. Thank you for bringing me into this and, you know, all of those other things. And I just, I can't believe I become a Star Wars nerd again. I mean, when I was a small child, we're talking like kindergarten, like Star Wars was one of the only pop culture things that really mattered to me. But I just, I, ne- I never, I never read those, I never read those books or anything. I didn't, I didn't know Star Wars existed outside of these three movies and the action figures that I'd had. I, and then I guess by the time I was aware of these other things, I just wasn't into Star Wars anymore. So I didn't really pursue them. And now I guess I've somehow become the Star Wars person, which is so weird. So thank you for joining on the show and for being one of my Star Wars mentors, as it were. So where can our where can our listeners find your work online? Let's see. I have some writing on comics at Shelf Dust that I was really proud of and happy to do. Uh, I have a fairly recent review of a reissue of one of the poet Hilda Doolittle's memoirs in the Poetry Project newsletter. You can order my chapbook, Heaven's Wish to Destroy All Minds, from Wo Aroa Press. Mall is Lost is actually out of physical print, so if you go to Adjunct Press, you can get a PDF of that for free. I have work in the incredible Nightboat anthology, We Want It All, a radical, an anthology of radical trans poetics. And then for the 10th anniversary of the really fantastic Philly Lit Magazine Bedfellas, they did this wonderful, lovely anthology, The Little Black Book, which I have work in alongside an illustration from a former student of mine, Bella Ghosh, who's fantastic. I think that's about it. Oh, also, obviously, Cerebro, Connor Goldsmith's iconic podcast. Check out the Jamie Braddock episode with you yeah. is really delightful. I think we might actually be Jamie comrades because yeah, I'm Jamie. Jamie I'm Madrox. Jamie Madrox. Yeah, we have yeah the two two Jamies with a great multiplicity of things going on with them. So yeah, I think I think queuing those episodes up one right after the other would be a great way to spend an evening if you are at all interested in X Men and queer theory and all of that. Indeed. Do check that out. And as for me, I continue to be on Twitter a little bit too much for now, at least. E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. That's E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. If and when that entire system collapses, you will probably find me under the same handle on whatever platforms the diaspora of social media relands to. And of course, Graphic Policy Radio, I'll continue to have episodes going up there. Do not worry, my Star Trek brethren, we have an episode of Deep Space Dive that'll be up quite soon. Um, All new, talking about DS9, the best Star Trek. And I also have some interviews coming up with some comics writers and artists, the meat and potatoes, as it were, of this podcast. I promise you I have not gone full Star Wars, but I do have a new appreciation for the series and what we can talk about through that show. And as we like to say, keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.